uh, I come from a classical um, settler colonial family uh, in the probably the worst sense of the word. Uh, three of my four grandparents are Australian and my fourth gr uh, grandparent is English. Uh, I often refer to myself as a, a, a grandchild of the empire because my grandfather was British Imperial Army in India and so I carry this sort of long history and I suppose it's a, a baggage of from that settler colonial background. Admittedly it's, it's Australian but no matter. And I also come from one of those really transnational uh, types of settler families. Um, my father was born in India, went to school in Hong Kong, England, Australia, did his graduate work in England and then got his job here in Canada. So just around the entire world, part of the, uh, the empire uh, per se. Um, I've often wondered if the reason I went into anthropology was to sort of work through uh, all of the issues that that involves, but I, I, I don't know that I would I'd necessarily put it that way. So it's, it's, I come from that kind of background. Uh, we came to Canada in 1959 when I was very, very young. Uh, my father came here for two years for a job, uh, and 57 years later we're still here. We, we never left. Um, we also, the interesting thing about that colonial family background or the settler colonial family background is that um, there was also, how do we say, a deep antipathy towards the colonial centers, the colonial metropolis, the, uh, Brit, the British. Uh, there was, despite the fact that my grandmother is British, there was no love lost for the British and even less love lost for the Americans in our family. Uh, so it, it, it does set you up in a kind of particular political uh, framework. Um, so that was the first thing that I, I thought that, that really has influenced my background. Um, the second thing that I think that I should note right at the beginning is that I come from an academic family. My father was an academic. He taught at the University of Manitoba. Uh, he taught oral pathology, so that's not exactly up my line, but uh, he taught. And so growing up, um, academics, graduate students were part of my life. Uh, I remember as a child, we'd go for our summer holidays and go, go fishing in our summer holidays. And there'd always be one of my dad's graduate students along. And my dad would sit at the back of the boat with the, the engine with a cigarette in his mouth and a cup of tea, and they'd argue through the student's thesis uh, while, they, while we were fishing. So I was brought up in that kind of atmosphere. Uh, so that kind of academic disputation, that thinking through problems was very, very much part of, of my life from, you know, from the youngest days. So that's the, one of the other things um, that I think we should note. Uh, I was also brought up in Winnipeg. Uh, I spent my entire childhood in Winnipeg. Well, not my very youngest childhood, but my entire childhood in Winnipeg. Uh, and a couple of things come out of that that, that uh, make me think a fair bit. One is uh, I grew up in, of course, an incredible... Uh, middle-class privilege. I realize that now. I, of course, didn't, didn't realize it at the time. Uh, an amazing middle-class privilege. And the First Nations were completely invisible to us. They, we, I never, I don't think I ever encountered a First Nations person until much, much later in my life. Uh, and the irony of that is that right down the street from my home was, in fact, the only residential school that was in Winnipeg. Uh, the Assiniboia Residential School, which was a, uh, a residence for high school students. And so First Nation students were in that residence. They were actually going to the high school that I went to. Uh, that's how it worked. They would live in the residence, Assiniboia residence, and they'd go to the high school. But I was completely and utterly unaware of this, completely and utterly clueless as to what this building was, what it meant, uh, anything about the education system that was going on. Um, which says a lot about Winnipeg, but I think it also says a lot about Canada in the 60s, that, that First Nations throughout that entire period were, were absolutely invisible to us. We had no idea that, they, they, uh, that there, were any, there was even anybody there. Um, and that speaks a lot also of the kind of racial divide that was and is in Winnipeg, um, uh, and how people like me just could grow up uh, completely ignorant of, of, of the, that, that other history that, the, that was there. So that was also part of, uh, part of my growing up. 
Um, the other thing which I, I kind of realized the other day, my wife was reading the, the newspaper and she, uh, she suddenly turned to me and she said, weren't you in major work? And I said, yeah. She said, well, there's a five-page article in the newspaper on, on this educational experiment in Winnipeg that took place in the late 50s and early 60s. And I never realized it uh, until actually a week ago when she read this article to me that I was part of a major educational experiment in Manitoba, uh, and I was the object of this experiment. And uh, I sort of, okay, uh, but it doesn't seem to have hurt me as far as I can tell. Uh, but it was in the 60s when there was a lot of experimentation going on in education. They were trying all kinds of new, new approaches and new ideas. Um, and so without, without me ever being aware of it, I was part of that kind of, kind of process. So it was kind of, kind of interesting to realize that, uh, educationally I had kind of a, a strange upbringing. Um, so th those are the kind of contours of the, that, that, uh, I was brought up in, um, uh, in, in, in Winnipeg, it's in the 60s, it's, uh, very middle class upbringing, very middle class academic upbringing. I don't know how or why or where, um, but somewhere around grade four or five, so somewhere when I'm about ten, nine or ten, I decided I wanted to be an archaeologist. I just decided that's what I wanted to, to be. Uh, actually, when I was in grade six, I actually trenched the back of the uh, schoolyard. We dug a, dug a trench the whole length of the schoolyard. Uh, of course, didn't find anything, but hey, that was, uh, or at least, uh, that was one of my, you know, first exercises in archaeology. I have no idea where that uh, that notion came from, um, but uh, it it uh, it was rather critical because um, in my in my last year at school in grade twelve, so I'm graduating from high school, about to go on to university. Uh, I came across a sign in the school saying that they were looking for students to work on archaeological digs in northern Manitoba. So since my parents thought it would be a good idea if I had a job that summer, um, I, uh, I went down and I applied for this job and I got it. And so I spent five summers, so that would have been 73, 74, 75, 76, and 77. I spent five summers um, doing archaeological work in, in the boreal forest area in northern Manitoba and northern Ontario. The, the, first, uh, the first three years um, were on the, I can't remember what it was properly called then, but it was any, anyways, it was on the Southern Indian Lake Diversion Project. So uh, at the same time they were developing uh, the rivers in northern Quebec, uh, in, in Manitoba, they were they were damming and developing a major hydro pro projects in northern Manitoba. Um, the reason, just as a side, the reason that northern Quebec got into legal trouble and got into the legal battle, which led to the very famous Maloof decisions and all of that, was because, of course, the land in northern Quebec had never been ceded. There were no treaties. And so the, the Cree in northern Quebec had the right, had, had legal grounds to fight it. The trouble in northern Manitoba was that it had been ceded under Treaty 5. Now, certainly the government interpretation of the treaties back in the late 60s and early 70s when all this was having, happening was that, well, they ceded the land, we can do whatever we want to do with it. And so you didn't get into the same kind of political, legal confrontation that you got into Quebec. But it was the same kind of development going on. And as part of that development, uh, Hi Manitoba Hydro had hired a group of archaeologists to do an archaeological survey of the area. And they had, and they'd, uh, they'd actually found an incredibly rich archaeological history in the area. It was quite amazing. And so I was on the cruise a the, the couple of years later that, uh, to actually dig some of those sites. And so uh, in 73, I was... I guess I was 17. Uh, 73, I was 17, we, we, I went up to northern Manitoba. I actually went to a place called Apachuana Lake, which is a lake on the western end of southern Indian Lake. And um, we dug sites up there. Uh, the, uh, I'll have to say in some ways the only thing I ever discovered in archaeology, uh, I found in that first, that first summer I dug up a pot. 
Uh, and that pot is on display in the Manitoba Museum of Man and Nature. And every time my grandchildren come to Winnipeg, they get dragged to the museum to see Grandpa's pot. Um, but uh, but but that was it was a very interesting experience. Um, for one thing, it 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 struck me that archaeology was the perfect job. You got to spend your summer in the bush. Well, we were in the bush. Uh, digging, you were outdoors, you got to go fishing, you got to do all kinds of things, and then you spent the winters in, in the academy doing, you know, the erudite things that we do in the academy. Uh, it's, to me, that was just the perfect job you could, you could ever want. Um, the interesting thing about that experience was that um, the, this was my first encounter with uh, First Nations on their own land. And it was not a happy encounter, uh, because uh, the 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 people of South Indian Lake are actually very interesting. The Cree, a uh, very interesting group of people, they had uh, originally been part of the Nelson House First Nation, and they had broken off. They'd left the reserve and broken off from Nelson House First Nation and established a fishing industry on South Indian Lake, and it was a very successful fishing industry. It was very, 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 they, it was a very good operation. They were running it well. And um, now, the, now that Hydra was flooding the lake, uh, it completely and utterly destroyed the fishing industry, destroyed the community, destroyed everything that these people had, had built up. Uh, that was my first encounter with, with this kind of thing. I mean, I remember it was actually in the second summer we were there uh, in 74. Um, we didn't realize it at first. But hydro had already raised the water levels. They were already five feet higher than they had been the year before. And um, one of the families from Southern Indian Lake who, who uh, was fishing down our end of the lake, who had their traditional fishing grounds at our end of the lake, uh, they came down and of course it was a complete washout, complete disaster. And their natural response, which I I, I understand it's not happy when you're part of it, but it was that they came onto our sites and they they kicked everything apart. They smashed all of the the um, the uh, um, the grid lines and everything that we'd set up on the site and and destroyed all of the the, uh, the way we'd been digging. But all you could do was sort of say, yes, I understand the anger. Right, and the anger and the, and the displacement that was that was already taking place, and I think that was really my first encounter um, with, in fact, the the colonial policies in Canada and the history of colonial policies in Canada in a very very real way, where you actually saw it happening and saw people responding in a very gut kind of fashion. So that archaeological experience was was. Uh, was a real eye opener for me, but um, so, uh, anyways, uh, that first summer uh, went up, worked in uh, on a Pachuana Lake, uh, went to the university in the fall, and I wanted to do archaeology. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, so I signed up, and I just have to say, I never ha have ever taken an introduction to social anthropology course. I've never done that, um, but I did do introduction to archaeology. Uh, with a guy called Chuck Amston. Uh, Chuck was actually a really interesting guy. Uh, he did his field work in Anaktuvik Pass in Alaska, um, and he was a very, very good teacher. But one of the things I realized, uh, I don't know whether that you still require this in anthropology, but uh, in those days you had to do the four fields of anthropology. So you had to do physical anthropology, social anthropology, archaeology, and linguistics, and you had to have credits in all four fields. Okay, so. I wanted to do archaeology. All right, got to got to do a linguistics course. So my first course in anthropology was actually in linguistics with Chris Wolfart, uh, the the Cree linguist. Um, I loved linguistics. Uh, I really thought this was really interesting, but uh, I like the kind of mathematical precision that you can sometimes get in linguistics. Um, the The problem was I realized that I have no ear for languages. And so there was no point in <laughs> me doing, well, I always say that I speak three languages badly, English, French, and Inuktitut. Um, but I had no ear for languages, so I, I, I couldn't do, uh, or at least I didn't think I could do linguistics. Then I did the introduction to archaeology with Chuck Amsden, and 
I have to say it was probably the hardest course I ever did in anthropo in, in actually in university. Um, but it was good. It was really good. And I really enjoyed it. So that's, and then of course I did a variety of other courses in first year, but that, uh, that's another matter. So I've got to go on in anthropology. Um, second, go into second year, so I figure, okay, I've got to get my social anthropology credit out of the way, and I've got to get my physical anthropology credit out of the way. I'm not going to talk about physical anthropology because that I've never done any of that. But social anthropology. So I signed up for a course which was called Social Organization in a Cross-Cultural cross Perspective. I think that's what it was called. Now, in those days at the University of Manitoba, uh, there was a guy called Tiger Birch who was teaching there. And Tiger was supposed to teach the course. Tiger is a well, very, very well-known. He's now dead, but he's a very, very well-known uh, Arctic anthropologist. And I was quite excited to do the course with Tiger. I didn't know this, of course, as a second year student, and I, and I, but that summer before I took the course, Tiger left and went and became an independent scholar. That's when he moved down to the Smithsonian and became an independent scholar at the Smithsonian. He left that summer, and so the University of Manitoba, at the last minute, had to find somebody to fill in to teach the course. I had no idea that this is what had happened. So I show up for my first day uh, in in my social org course, and this tall, skinny, gangly guy with a kind of straggly beard walks in, and he puts up a, a map of Australia on the front of the class, and he cracks a joke about how this was the ultimate assimilationist map, since the Australian Aboriginal reserves were marked on it in pink, and the ink was gradually fading over over time. Uh, he cracks this joke about uh, about it being an assimilationist map, and then he launches into um, a discussion of Australian Aboriginal kinship systems. Uh, it was actually an Aranda-type system that he was discussing and drawing out on the board. Like, this is my first class in social anthropology. And I sat there just completely and utterly stunned, and I thought, I love this. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I don't care about archaeology. I don't care about any of this other stuff. This is fabulous. This is absolutely great. Uh, I, this kinship stuff is just out of the world fantastic. Well, that was David Turner. Uh, that's the first time I met David Turner, uh, who, as the story will go on, and as, as you well know, is, is became my supervisor. Um, but it was, an, it was an absolutely eye-opening revelation to me. And I hate to say it, but even to this day, I get really excited by that stuff. If I can read, uh, I, and this is what I do in my spare time, what little there is, I'm, I'm still happy to read stuff on Australian Aboriginal kinship systems. I mean, most people think that it's mad, but uh, it's just wonderful to me. Uh, and if you want, you know, I can still stand up and, and I can probably lecture it, uh, even we know we're about 40, 45 years later now. Um, but anyway, so David was, David was teaching uh, this uh, social organization course in in David's own particular style. It was a, it was a very, very difficult course, um, but I loved every moment of it, everything we did. There were a couple of other pieces. Um, I had an interest, because I still had an interest in the North, I had an interest in the Arctic. Um, uh, I, d I did that year uh, the course in Arctic Anthropology, uh, not Arctic Anthropology, Arctic Archaeology with Chuck Amston. And so I think I can fairly claim that up until 1974, I've read everything on Arctic, anthro anth uh, Arctic ar archaeology. I haven't read anything since 1974, but not that it matters. Uh, um, and I will say that one of the books for that course was a book called Ancient Men of the Arctic by Louis Giddings. One of the most exciting books I've ever read. If you ever want to ensnare somebody into doing anthropology, I don't even, it's not in print anymore, but it's wonderful. Uh, it, it tells Giddings' story of him, uh, his field experiences, and then alternating, alternating chapters between his field experiences and then his reflections on how this contributed to archaeology. Uh, just such an exciting book. But anyway, so uh, I was doing Arctic ar archaeology with, with Chuck, um, and that, again, was an extremely exciting and interesting course, and it was something that I really, really enjoyed. 
The other person who was teaching Arctic in, in at U of M in those days was uh, a guy called John Mathiason. Uh, he did, well, later on, he did the book called Living on the Land. Uh, he, he worked in Pond Inlet. Um, John, uh, and I wanted to do John's course on Arctic ethnography, um, but unfortunately, and this happens at universities, the scheduling didn't work out. It overlapped with one of my other courses, uh, so I couldn't take it. So I thought, okay, well, I'm missing out on, on um, um, doing John's course on, on uh, Arctic uh, ethnography. So to sort of give myself the background and catch up on it, uh, for my major paper for David Turner, I decided to do, our, our assignment was to do a reanalysis of, of a kinship system on, ba based on the kind of principles that David was teaching us, right? So I decided to do the Caribou Inuit. In those days we still use Caribou Eskimo, but uh, I decided to do the Caribou Inuit. So I read all the literature on the Caribou Inuit for that paper, and I did uh, did that uh, did that paper um, for David uh, in in a second year course. Um, so that's the first time I read any Inuit ethnography. Uh, it's the first time I had ever encountered that material. Um, I would hate to think what that paper said now. I mean, I would, looking back on it, I have no idea what was in it. Uh, David liked it. That, 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 that's all that mattered, and I got an A-plus on the paper. And at the end of the year, David said to me, uh, he said, well, Chris, he said, uh, when you want to go on to graduate studies, uh, give me a call, and, and uh, you can do graduate studies with me. The other thing that happened was that at the end of that year, David was only at University of Manitoba for one year. And at the end of that year, he moved and went to the University of Toronto. So he left and went to the University of Toronto. Um, I'm, I'm not the kind of person, uh, I, I guess instant gratification is what I was after. I went to my father and I said, Dad, this is the guy I want to study with. This is one I, what I want to study. I want to transfer to the University of Toronto. Now, my father, being an academic, it took a fair, fairly substantial argument for me to get that to get that through, but he agreed. And at the end of my second year, going into my third year, I transferred from the University of Manitoba to the University of Toronto. So, in what year are we now? It'd be seventy-five. In seventy-five, I I moved to Toronto, and uh, and <laughs> I got to Toronto and um, signed up for signed up for my courses in Toronto and uh, went down to David's office and walked into David's office and he looked at me and he just sort of said, well, what the hell are you doing here? And I said, well, you told me that if, you, if I wanted to come and study with you, I could come and study with you, so here I am. And uh, he said, okay. And uh, I worked with David, at, well, I worked with David uh, uh, from then on in. So that was, that was how I got into um, into social anthropology per se, it was, it was falling in love with a very, very particular uh, approach. I had no idea, of course, at the time that, that uh, David's particular approach to, uh, to, to kinship social organization was, how do we put it politely, was not the mainline approach, uh, that it was quite a out there theoretical approach. But it, it, it struck me as, as, it made sense to me, and that's, that's what counted. So, uh, I started out in archaeology. Um, I'll just say the archaeology lasted for a couple more years. I, I did three summers at Southern Indian Lake. One summer, uh, we got a contract, uh, a fellow called Jim Wood, Jim was the guy I worked with, we got a contract to do a survey of the Terrell Sea Beach, which runs parallel to, the, to Hudson's Bay between Churchill and Gillum. And so we basically worked our way up the Terrell Sea Beach. We didn't find anything. My first publication is why I didn't find anything. Uh, I was not a successful archaeologist. Uh, the next year, uh, in 77, 77, I got a contract working with the, the um, Constance Lake Band in northern Ontario doing a uh, kind of archaeological historical project with them. Uh, they are a group of OG Cree in northern Ontario. Um, working for a band, this was my first experience working for and with a band. It was a very interesting experience. And we traveled down the Kanagami River to the Albany River and down the Albany River to the Ghost River. And um, 
uh, one of the things we did is I was the first person to go and look for Henley House. Henley House is the first inland Hudson's Bay Company post. Um, I didn't find that either. Uh, what I did find out, and this was a good lesson to learn, is that in fact it was incorrectly marked on the Hudson's Bay Company maps and deliberately incorrectly marked so that people couldn't find it. Uh, it turned out to be about two miles up the river from where I was. But at least I looked at where it was supposed to be and found out that it wasn't there. Um, somebody else later found it, but uh, that's my archaeological career, never finding anything. So it was probably a good thing that I got out of it and, uh, uh, and switched over to social anthropology. But uh, it, was, it was really good while I was a student having those summers of experience and engagement with uh, in in the bush on First Nations land with First Nations people, and beginning to get some kind of sensibilities about uh, about the about the colonial histories that were really really influencing uh, these groups of people. So it was it was fascinating work, but uh, I, I I'm glad I I didn't uh, keep up with it. And I'll uh, one of the other things I learned and. This should just be the last story. It was, it was really interesting. One night uh, when I was at Constance Lake, about 11 o'clock at night, the guy I was staying with said, we got to go get some gas for the truck. Why would you go get gas at 11 o'clock at night? I had no idea. So I went with him. We, we, what I didn't know is that there was a bar attached to the, the gas station, and we were actually going to the bar. Uh, and it was classical in Northern Ontario in those days. All the First Nations guys on one side, and all, they were all French-Canadian, actually. That's a French belt in Northern Ontario. All the French guys on the other side of the bar. And I discovered that the reason that I had been invited along is I was a designated driver. I got handed the keys to the truck, and I was the guy who, who had to drive everybody home. And I realized that when you're working within a community, within a context, uh, you can take on some very, very strange roles, but they're they're really important roles in terms of well, <laughs> you can help things out. I'm not sure that driving a, pile, a truckload of drunks home in, at three in the morning is necessarily terribly constructive, but it it meant that I was totally immersed and engaged in the kind of way of life that we were involved in. Uh, it was quite something. Yeah, so I think that that covers up up until we get to uh, to graduate school. So.